Well, good afternoon, everyone. How is everybody today? I hope you're all doing really, really great. I uh, have been waiting anxiously for this one o'clock hour to get here in anticipation of this first broadcast of our Family Empowerment Now group. And I'm really excited to see and uh, hear from everybody who said that they were going to join. And I look forward to seeing you all as you as you come on board and um, say hello to me. Hi, Denise. Hi, Irma. And Lynn Marie is down from Florida. We got people all over the place. This is going to be great. There's people that are supposed to be joining us internationally, and I look forward to it. So anyway, as I was saying, I've been looking forward to this opportunity because I am super excited about the Family Empowerment Now group and what I really consider to be a grassroots movement that we can start together to really get behind families who are struggling with uh, all forms of uh, mental illness and cognitive deficits, as well as you know those who are, who are dealing with elderly patients or clients or family members and are doing it professionally or or you know personally. I it kind of that kind of brought me um, to one of the topics that I wanted to discuss today, and this is just going to be a brief informal discussion that I want to just throw a few topics out there for you guys. And you know we're supposed to have 20, 25 people joining us today. And um, Melissa just joined. Hey, Melissa. You know, next month when I do this, I hope to have twice as many people. And then, you know, maybe we'll have another 10 after that and 10 after that. The point is, is that we all have to be part of this group together. We have to grow this group organically. It's the only way to do it, and it takes a lot of time, which uh, I'm finding out the hard way because I'm not very patient. But... Um, you know, with your support and with the people that you guys know and the circles that you interact in, uh, we can really grow this group and offer a lot of help to a lot of a lot of folks. Uh, so I have a, a, a special gift that I'm going to give to everybody today as well. I'm going to offer it up to the entire group, which I'm happy to say we've already pushed over 100 people. Um, that took a very uh, short period of time. I was shocked that our group is already over 100, and I want to keep offering more support and more um, uh, content and resources to you guys within this group, and hopefully start to really get some more dialogue going and, and share some stories and, and get uh, get out there in front of you more. The first thing that I wanted to, to talk to you about, and some of you guys already know this, is um, I've been dealing with an elderly aunt and uncle for, uh, well, years now, but just in, since uh, last Thanksgiving, my, my uncle became really gravely disabled, really, really ill, suffering from a, a bunch of uh, different types of ailments, including COPD and, and, uh, and other things like that. And one of the things that I noticed was that every time he went into the hospital, which was frequent, uh, you know, almost every other week he was going to a hospital, Anyway, he, he kept developing more and more illnesses, and he would uh, take on um, what a lot of people call institutional dementia, which is the confusion that people get very often when they are institutionalized, particularly in the elderly, and they start exhibiting uh, dementia-like behaviors. It's kind of like sundowner syndrome, uh, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. But the reason that I bring this up is because um, – while he was there, he kept getting more illnesses. He would get it almost compound himself. And one of the one of the social workers at this particular hospital said, "You know, this is the worst place for your uncle to be. This hospital is not the place for a guy like him to be. He's too frail. He's too old, uh, and there's just too many germs and bacteria and things like this." Um, then fast forward to uh, just a, a month ago or so. Uh, now, now he passed away. Unfortunately, my uncle passed away back in June, uh, so now it's just me uh, with with my aunt, and she broke her hip about a month ago, and I'm happy to say that she's actually going to be going home next week back to her apartment, which is astonishing to me. But I went to bring my daughter, who is six years old, to go visit her in the hospital, and um, and and. And I also was going to bring her to the skilled nursing facility where she's currently going through rehab. And uh, my very good friend, Lauren, who is not on the call right now, 
uh, basically it works in the medical field and in the hospital setting and said to me, you know, Mike, Ellie's only six. Don't bring her to a hospital. Don't bring her to a nursing home. Don't. It's just better that she she not go into that environment. And, and it was it wasn't cold hearted at all. What she meant by that was there's just a lot of things going on in hospitals and and whatnot these days that we should all be aware of. So I'm telling you this story because um, many of the folks that we uh, have in our families that are suffering from mental illness or other other uh, cognitive issues are in and out of hospitals and therefore we're in and out of hospitals and I just want to bring it to everybody's attention that you know it seems that increasingly our hospitals and, and unfortunately these skilled nursing facilities are becoming more and more of a petri dish if you will for these these crazy bacteria I mean we've all heard of C. diff and MRSA but and, and, and then on the 13th, I know that I posted for all of you guys this article that was in the New York Times, nursing homes are a breeding ground for fatal fungus. And this thing is called Candida auris or something like that. And it's a new fungus that's another one of these super germs that we can't kill. Anyway, the point being, again, think twice before we want to put people who are already compromised in terms of their system into facilities that may or may not be the right placement for them. And that's something that we should consider in terms of least restrictive placement in any circumstance, right? But but it just, you know, as I said in my in my email, I don't believe in, in coincidences. And for this issue to come up three or four different times in my private life and then have this article come across my desk from somebody who I haven't seen in years, I just thought it was just something interesting that we should all be aware of on a global level and we'll just leave it at that. Um, something that we may want to be more aware of on a personal level but also on a professional level and I know a couple of you guys uh, are working in the uh, caregiver space on a professional basis and many of you are here because of family members. So what we wind up having to do is we wind up getting ourselves into decision-making roles very often and uh, Lynn Marie may be able to give us some more insight into this, but again, something that's come up in my family around my aunt and uncle with this DNR, DNI issue, and a phone call that I got from some of my friends down in Florida uh, who are professional guardians, they uh, have been raising this issue with me and asking me professionally uh, my, my opinion and my advice on this concept, do not resuscitate do not intubate. And this is a big, big question that I've been asked uh, hundreds of times throughout the years about, you know, do I uh, do a, a DNR, do not resuscitate, or do I sign a do, DNI, do not intubate, right? Um, because it's a very personal, it's a very invasive potentially uh, procedure, but it's also a very personal decision that people may have or have not made. Um, and I've been struggling with this on a, on a professional basis for many, many years. And, and I'm going to tell you straight up, my personal uh, decision on this is that I, as a professional, will not sign off, uh, do not resuscitate, do not intubate documentation for a client unless it is the 11th hour and I get a court order telling me that it's okay to do so. One of the issues that's come up um, I know in Florida was that a professional fiduciary um, had a case where she had not heard from the family in years and years and years and the family had been separated. The, her client had not seen or heard from his family in years and years and years and um, she signed the DNR DNI, and uh, once the family found out that that happened, and the, and the gentleman passed away, they raised all kinds of havoc, and they're making the, the life, the, the woman's life miserable. I mean, her career is done, her license is in jeopardy, uh, her cash, her, her credibility is shot, and it's really, it's uh, really, really a shame that that had to happen. But when we are working with our family members, you know, I, I signed off on a DNR, DNI for my uncle because I knew my uncle. I knew what his wishes were. I knew what he would or would not want to tolerate is in, in his life. 
so I guess the most important thing to come from any of this is communicate, man. We are family. We are all family members. We've got to be able to communicate and talk to each other about our wishes in terms of end of life strategies uh, or even, even invasive surgery type things. And this may seem a, a bit far afield for a discussion where we have parents of young, younger people who are dealing with um, mental illnesses. It may even seem a little far afield for parents or, or adults who have uh, uh, um, parents who are getting older and, and not, you know, aging out, they're aging inappropriately or they're aging or they're, they're sick. But so many times this, this communication is lost and it could be just a simple conversation um, that you can have. In fact, I'm going to be posting an article, um, and Melissa's going to have to remind me of this, but I have um, a whole big article that I created about terms that we can use to engage our loved ones in conversations around these exact things. Uh, my uncle that just passed away is my grandmother's brother, and, you know, she never wanted to talk about, about end-of-life stuff. It was, it was taboo. But I think, you know, that culture has changed a lot. And I really encourage everybody to communicate within your family. And when you're helping others to make a decision, or if you have to be a surrogate decision maker, it's very important to understand a person's core beliefs in this, in this particular area. And so that's sort of my quasi-professional um, uh, and also personal approach or topic that I want to discuss this week. If you notice, the first topic, I just want to discuss something that's global and can impact all of us. Uh, the second topic that I want to discuss was just that, the DNR, DNI thing that impacts us professionally, but could also impact us very, very personally. Um, and again, my answer to that question has always been, I do not sign a DNR, DNI for somebody I don't know, unless it's a, a end of life issue, it's an 11th hour issue, and um, I get blessing from the court to do so. I just don't do it. It's my personal professional opinion, um, and, I, and I strongly uh, suggest to other fiduciaries the same thing. So anyway, the final topic that I wanted to talk about in this brief and first um, discussion with you all is the idea about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And this has come up probably five times with me in the last, I don't know, four weeks maybe. And when I'm talking about post-traumatic stress disorder or post-traumatic stress right now, I'm not talking about the person in your life, your loved one with mental illness or any other kind of cognitive deficit. The post-traumatic stress that I'm worried about and that I'm seeing more and more come about is the post-traumatic stress that you are suffering as a family member who's trying to care for another individual. I worry about the, the trauma that is being inflicted upon the younger sibling, or the not even the younger sibling, the other siblings that are living in the home of, of a person with mental illness. You know, the thing that is so powerfully neglected in the understanding of mental illness and, and what goes on in, in our families is that small little pebble in, in the pond effect, right? The ripple effect and how many ways and how many people it impacts and just keeps going out and out and out and out. And I have had experience in the last, I can't even tell you, three, four weeks where the younger siblings of folks, of, of young people with mental illness are traumatized by what they've seen their families going through. And, and I was thinking about how to sort of explain it or make an analogy today. And, and here's what I came up with. I hope it works. Maybe it won't. I had a friend who had a real successful restaurant. Okay. That was his family. That restaurant was his family. Um, and, and that, in terms of my analogy here, okay? So that restaurant was really successful. It was around for 35, 30, 35 years. 
Now all of a sudden he said, hey, you know what? I, I got to pay attention to, to – I want to do something else. I got another issue to, to pay attention to. So he started paying attention to that so much so that he neglected the original restaurant. This analogy is not working. I could tell it's not working just as I'm saying it out loud to myself. Anyway, the point being, as Lynn rewrites, caregiver burnout facts about 85% of the families in the U.S. So 85% of you guys out there, and thank you, Lynn Marie, who are caring for another pre person are going to get burned out if you don't take care of yourselves. And your other kids or the other people in your home are going to get burned out if you don't remember that what's important is that initial restaurant, that first real core. Uh, in this case, it was his cash cow. But in your case, it's the real core of what makes the essence of you, of your family. You have to remember that you guys have to come first. And if you don't put yourselves first, you're going to neglect everything else around you. And it's so easy to do. It happens all the time. And those other kids that are in your house or that other person who's living with you, you know, you have an in-law living with you or whatever, they're going to be impacted by this whole process as well. You all have to take care of yourselves so that you could take care of other people, especially your loved one with mental illness. And we see it. <laughs> I've actually seen uh, on numerous occasions the burnout impacting the professional caregivers. So providers who are in the community are in the middle of a meeting and they're breaking down sobbing because they're trying so hard to reach Johnny and try to get Johnny to understand the impact of his alcoholism on his uh, bipolar disorder or whatever the case may be. And I was shocked and stunned and touched and moved by this one particular worker who, who just was just so overwhelmed with her disappointment in her own ability to reach this guy.